We are back on Morning Line and it's Tuesday. Thanks for joining us, talking about um, one of our most cherished, if not the most cherished amendment in our Constitution. The first with us is Ken Paulson, director of the Free Speech Center at MTSU. It's good to have him with us this morning. Really appreciate you being here. You know, as uh, we were going to the uh, the break, we were talking about, uh, you know, freedom of speech and where it applies and where it doesn't. 26% uh, in this Freedom Forum survey uh, of Americans do not know it applies. Uh, or does not apply in private workplace. That kind of surprised me. I mean, shouldn't we know that? You would think so. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, the entire U.S. Constitution is about establishing what the government looks like, what, how it works, what the system is, and then the Bill of Rights are the deal that say, hey, yeah. okay, government, you've got all this power, but these things you can't, you can't interfere with. And that only applies to the government. It doesn't apply to your boss. So when you get a job, um, you're basically entering into a contract and the contract is to do whatever they ask you to do in exchange for money and they can ask you not to talk about politics on the job they can uh if you're profane in the workplace they can control that you have no first amendment rights on the job so when we talk about sometimes you hear the phrase cancel culture or the like but we see social media you see facebook or twitter maybe banning someone okay um taking them off because of things that they've posted or you see an nfl owner saying i'm not going to have any player kneel on the sideline of a football game in my stadium and people will get upset about that and say you're censoring but all those entities have a right to do that and, and the people they're restricting have a right to say well to heck with you i quit i'm leaving i'm going to go do what i want but if they want to stay there and work for that owner and play on that team they have to abide by the rules, correct? Well, that's true. And, and in every case, it's essentially a marketplace. Um, you know, you can decide you want to be there or not based on the rules they have. You can sign a long-term contract, perhaps if you're in a certain kind of job, but that contract spells out what, what your rights are or are not, are not. So private enterprise has its own free speech rights. Um, something like the Hobby Lobby, which is a right. successful business, can decide not to be open on Sunday because of the Sabbath, and that's their First Amendment right. So, it, you know, we do have a tradition of free speech in America, and the expectation is that institutions will not unnecessarily limit what you say, but it's there, they're giving you money, you agree to do the job in exchange for the cash, and that's the American way. Now, that's not to say you won't feel some retribution if you choose to protest a certain way on your own, whether it's on the job or elsewhere. What, what do you think of the phrase cancel culture? I mean, we've seen cases like, like the disgusting scene in Williamson County where they had the protest outside over masks and there were some confrontations outside. And some of those individuals involved with that, he was picked up by the media. And I think some of them uh, had trouble returning to wherever it was they worked because uh, they were disturbed by the way they behaved outside of the workplace. I mean, is cancel culture, um, how, how do you see that phrase? How do you apply that? Well, you know, cancel culture is a, a phrase I'm really uncomfortable with because I, I, to be very honest, it's hypocritical. It's always right. used for political purposes. Now, you know, the suggestion to cancel culture, which is basically a lot of people condemn you and call for you to be job, uh, lose your job or lose your livelihood because of something you said. The notion that that's something that came up in 2021 is nuts. You know, at the Free Speech Center, we are nonpartisan. We are not political. We are educational. And our most controversial stand is that the First Amendment is a very good thing and people shouldn't mess with it. That's what we believe in. And what troubles me about the use of cancel culture the phrase, is, and, and currently, let's be honest, is being used largely by the right to say that the left is intolerant and wants to limit our free speech. Well, where were they when the Dixie Chicks were being trampled mm -hmm. because of Natalie Maine's comments about President Bush? You know, you go back throughout history, right. throughout the history of popular culture, people have lost their job because of their beliefs in the late 1940s throughout the 1950s it was actually the right that ended people's careers because of the perception that they tilted towards socialist views so this is not one party or the other it is always happening what has changed and the reason cancel culture gets so much attention now is that think about your own personal life if you're at a party in the neighborhood and some says something that's insensitive he's a jerk the, the rest <laughs> of the neighbors say Bob, you're nuts, you know, go home. Mm -hmm. Well, 
<laughs> that's what happens on a much larger scale on the internet. Yeah. You, you put your opinion out there and people will say, you know what, you're a fool and we want you not to be part of our lives or maybe we want you off the service. Yeah. Um, but it's not new. Americans have always judged people on what they have said and, and frankly have demanded retribution for it. It may or may not be healthy for America, but the notion that it's something new and one political party does it is just hypocritical. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's political. And But you know what? It's not new. And I, I'll be honest with you, Ken. If uh, I know someone who is a uh, merchant that I discover is a bigot and I don't appreciate their opinions, it may have nothing to do with the product they sell, but I will not frequent that place. That's my choice. I'm not going to wish them to go out of business, but they're not getting another penny from me. And there's, that's the American way right there. Absolutely, and boycotts are very much a part of the American tradition. If you want better working conditions and you decide not to come to work or to buy certain products, that's exactly how America works. Right. Hey, listen, we have a phone call from Ann. Ann, good morning. Hi, Ann. Good morning. Good morning. First, I was shocked that I knew all five, um, <laughs> and I thank Open Line or Morning Line for that because that's probably why I knew all five. Ah. Um, and I went to my first organized protest in 1978 and have the national banner pictures to show it and went to my last protest four months ago so um i am one of the 20 percent our governor as well as other governors in the last 18 months have tried to put restrictions on peaceful protests and I would like to know your opinion of when governors or people in positions try to put regulations on just that, because it was done to restrict peaceful protest and only peaceful protesters. And I think that is a far reaching and I'd like seriously to know a professor's opinion on when this is done. Thank you, Ann. We appreciate your call as always. Go ahead, Ken. Well, you, you raise a legitimate point of concern. I'm actually most troubled by what's happening in Florida, where the governor there has actually supported legislation that basically makes a crime more serious if you broke a window, for example, if you did it in the act of protest. So, mm -hmm. you know, th that's an effort to to penalize protest more severely than just the action that's being occurred, that's, that is occurring. Here's the good news, is the power and right of assembly is very much protected. And, and some of the restrictions you are now seeing in a flurry from certain governors, it just won't stand. We have an absolute right to gather together and raise our voices in protest. Now, there's something in the law that allows government to create uh, regulations regarding the time, the place, and the manner of a protest. So think about downtown Nashville. You could not have a protest at 5 p.m. Uh, on a Tuesday during the high, in the evening and during the height of the rush hour. Uh, first place, you couldn't walk down there, mm -hmm. as we all know. Sure. Trying to, get, trying to get past pedal taverns, but they would never grant that license because it would create chaos in the city. They, however, cannot tell you you can't protest at five, and they can't tell you you can't protest at five anywhere in Nashville. So what they could do is say, seven's a better time here, or you could be three blocks away at five. They have to provide a reasonable alternative that allows you to reach a similar audience. The, those are very important rules and they, they hold up very well. So there's a limit to what government can do to limit protest and that's a good thing. In the end, courts will typically find that people have that right to gather and the Constitution protects us. But in the short term, there are legislators and there are governors who will support unconstitutional regulations uh, and score some political points and excites their base even though it can be very wrong. Let's shift gears just a bit here now to talk about freedom of press and, you know, what we do here in Channel 5 and newspapers and publications and TV stations across the country. Just according to the uh, Freedom Forum survey, just 14 percent of Americans have a strong trust in journalists. It doesn't surprise me that it's low. I understand journalists' popularity rating just 
a little bit behind lawyers when it comes to sometimes how you're viewed. But that's disturbing to me because at the same time, I think many Americans do recognize the importance of having um, journalists try to keep tabs on their government one way or the other and, and, and right and wrong in society. So what's your take on that? Well, first of all, let me disclose that I spent uh, roughly half my career as a journalist. Um, most recently, I was the editor-in-chief of USA Today, and I've spent I think I've managed, I've edited five different newspapers across America. Um, so I have this view that's actually inside American journalism, and I, I know how it really works, and, and the kind of numbers you're sharing uh, are disheartening and disturbing. You know, uh, Nick, as you probably know, so many in this profession got into it because they're idealistic. They want to build a better society. They want to disclose the truth. They want to keep corruption in check. Good people enter this profession because um, it feels important and good and beneficial. They do not do it for the salary, and they do not do it for the convenient hours they work. So I come from that perspective, and, and I need to share that up front. I think it's an American tragedy that Americans have so little faith in a free press, and it's it bodes very poorly for the future of this country. I'm by nature an optimist. But I'm so deeply concerned about what we're seeing, the American people turning on the media. It's not new. Spiro Agnew, the vice president of Richard Nixon, uh, mastered this in the late 60s and early 70s. He's the guy who, who developed the model for politicians to follow ever since. You know, now it's called fake news. But in those days, Agnew was talking about professors and journalists as nattering nabobs of negativism mm -hmm. and and created this model for politicians to say, you know what, you don't need to trust them. They're crooked, they're biased, and all, and all of that. Um, and what that does, it undermines the influence of a free press in in the process. And uh, what what is mind-boggling to me, Nick, is, mm -hmm. is the notion that people think that uh, that corruption is not an issue in America. You know, the, the very purpose of free press in 1791 was to keep a check on people in power. If you dismiss the people who are doing that job, who every day strive to report what's really happening from our public officials, corruption will get dramatically worse. Right. It is not as though human nature has changed. It is not as though no one needs to keep an eye on government anymore. If you if you do not buy a newspaper, if you do not watch local news, if you do not support American journalism, you are defunding journalism and that watchdog role, much as people get upset about talk of defunding police. The, the concern about defunding police is that they won't stop crime. Crime will get out of hand. If you do not support American journalism, you will have corruption, the likes of which this nation has never seen. Police officers have no time to look at the books in the mayor's office. That's reporters do that. And we need to support American journalism for that purpose. So what's happening is politicians, whether noble or ignoble, whether they are doing their job well or they are corrupt to the core, it is so easy to dismiss the press as being negative and fake news because it takes the heat off them but they're damaging democracy in the long run and we can't let them do that yeah i obviously agree with that we have to go to a break on that note but um certainly there's a huge marketplace out there there's a lot going on but i can tell you exactly when things started going to crap ken and that's when we got rid of the fairness doctrine we're going to take a break and we'll be back more to talk about that and more taking some calls right after this